What type of customer research did you do in developing the cyber truck? Oh, zero. <laughs> customer research? <laughs> hey, I'm Stephen and this is Solving the Money Problem. If you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. So in this video, I'm going through a few clips from a recent Daily Drive podcast Elon Musk did. In it, he discusses all sorts of things, including why they chose Austin, Texas as a location for the new Gigafactory, their market research leading up to the Cybertruck design, and plenty more. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hey guys, if you'd like to help out the channel and get up to two free stocks, check out the links in the description to Weeble and Stake. Let's get back to it. Texas is actually our second biggest market in the US, even though there's some challenges on selling in Texas. Despite that, it's still our second biggest market in the US. You know, when, when talking to key members of the team that would need to move to Austin from California in order to get the factory going, Austin was their top pick, to be totally frank. That was a, a big factor in choosing Texas and Austin, specifically Austin. I guess a lot of people from California, if you ask them what's the one place you'd move outside of California, it's Austin. So that, that, that was a big factor because I just went around the room with the team and said, hey, where do you want to spend time? You know, and where would you potentially move? And they're like, well, Austin was just the number one choice. So that's that's why, <laughs> that's kind of why we picked uh, Austin. And I asked them, like, well, what about Dallas? And they're like, well, no, they just want to go to Austin. So I'm like, okay, you know, we're a very, very talented team. And it really makes a difference if where, where they want to go, you know, so... This really says a lot about the kind of leader Elon Musk is. The fact that he would ask his key personnel at Tesla, where would you like to move? Where would you be happy living? Super important. A lot of leaders would just say, look, you're going here or you don't have a job anymore. But Elon understands the key critical personnel they have at Tesla matter. So where would they be happy moving to? Just a quick aside, pre-pandemic, I actually plan on moving to the US to create some better content for you guys, do interviews, factory tours, get to the live events, etc. I don't mind flying around the country, so it doesn't really matter where I was. My shortlist this ended up being California and Texas. Guess where I picked? Austin. And this is some random Australian guy that decides, you know what, I wanted to move to the US, doesn't really matter where. Where is the best place that I can go to meet my personal needs? I'll fly to Tesla events, that's fine, but I just want to be on the same continent. Isn't that interesting? There's a certain critical mass of engineering and manager, management talent that are needed to create this factory and do the manufacturing engineering. And, and like I said, our factories are not just, you know, making a copy. It's each factory is a product and each factory has a lot of innovation and a, each factory is more advanced than the last one. So th th there's a massive amount of manufacturing engineering and, and that wraps back into the product engineering. So we make the car design easier to manufacture and we improve the manufacturing system itself. So basically we need a lot of smart, talented people. It's, it's not like, hey, let's just drop a copy machine somewhere. The factory itself is the product. As I said on the earnings call, the factory is the product won the car. So it matters where are the very talented people willing to go and what is an uphill battle. Austin was not an uphill battle. That's why we picked Austin. Here we have Elon talking again about the machine that makes the machine. If you were paying attention there, you will have noticed that Elon was explaining that there's a huge amount of engineering and design that goes into each factory, not just the factory itself and the manufacturing systems, but there's a feedback loop between the product design and the factory design. So each version, the Model Y that's made in the US, is let's call that version one of the Model Y. The Model Y being made in Shanghai in China, version 1.5, it's different, it's better, it's improved. And then version two of the Model Y will appear here in the Berlin Gigafactory, again with improvements and new efficiencies and optimizations, and those need to be factored into the factory design and the manufacturing processes. So even though Tesla is building multiple Gigafactories at the moment, none of them are the same, and the products inside that are actually coming out, while they might look the same externally, aesthetically, they're actually quite different internally. They're being manufactured in even more efficient and better ways. This is really cool to see. And just project forward, what does Tesla look like in five, 10 years if they continue to iterate and improve their factories, their products, and their manufacturing systems? Oh boy. Do I think at some point we will have a third plant in North America? Uh, I think that's very likely. Over, over what kind of time frame? Can you even see the time horizon at this point? Probably four or five years. I mean, this is not a, this is, you're literally just asking me, it's not like I've got like, let me literally consult my strategic plan. Of like, uh, this is literally a spur of the moment. <laughs> um, rough guess, probably would start construction in four years ish. That's, that's just like my sort of stream of consciousness guess. If we read into the tea leaves a little bit here, we might come to some interesting conclusions. Let's say three, four, five years, somewhere around that half decade mark, there's a third factory in the US beginning construction or just completed. If there's three factories in the US, what are the odds that there's only going to be one in China slash Asia and one in Europe? Zero. I'm calling it now. If there's three factories in the US by 2025, there'll be at least two in Asia, most likely China, and at least two in Europe. Hope I'm wrong. I hope there's more. At the end of the day, the thing that really matters is consumer satisfaction. And if you look at consumer satisfaction about Teslas, they're the highest of, of any car on the market. So all things considered, there's no question 
that people are happiest with our cars than, than any other vehicle. And that's true. If you look at the consumer reports, you know, when, when they do their survey or J.D. Power does their survey, we actually are the highest on consumer satisfaction. So we may not be perfect in every respect, but what really matters as a consumer, if you're buying a car, is your satisfaction after the purchase, all things considered. And Tesla has the highest in the industry. Those of you who own a Tesla will already know this in and out, but for everyone else, especially investors, this is really important. The whole point of creating a product is to satisfy your customers, right, to meet their needs. And Tesla is absolutely slaying it at the most important thing. This is why they're dominating and why they do not need to advertise because the products are so good. They literally sell themselves. How many people who own a Tesla are watching? Let me know in the comments. How many people who own a Tesla told somebody about it, took them for a drive, wanted to show off how awesome the Tesla is and eventually your friend, family member, whatever bought a Tesla because you mentioned it, you showed them, you exposed them to the great product for the first time. What type of customer research did you do in developing the Cybertruck? Oh, zero. <laughs> customer research? <laughs> no, I, I mean, we just made a car, a car we thought was awesome. And, uh, you know, it looks super weird. I, I mean, I just wanted to make a futuristic, you know, like a futuristic battle tank. That's something that looks like it could come out of Blade Runner or Aliens or something like that, you know. And But, but that is also highly functional. So it was like it had incredible capabilities. Basically, it was like faster than a Porsche 911 and more towing power, more trucking capability than F-150. So it's a better better sports car than 911, better truck than F-150, and it's armored, and it looks sort of kick-ass from the future. That was the goal. Recognizing that uh, this could be a complete failure. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and people were like, oh, wow, you're crazy. Uh, that car doesn't look like any other car. We are not going to buy it. That could have been one of the outcomes. But I wasn't super worried about that because it's like, okay, if, if it turns out nobody wants to buy our weird looking truck, then well, the normal truck, no problem. There's like there's lots of normal trucks out there that look pretty much the same. You can hardly tell the difference. And sure, we could just do, just do some coffee cat truck. That's, that's easy. So that's our fullback strategy. Yeah? So I didn't think it was all that risky to coming out with a cyber truck because it might have just been some weird niche product that not many people were interested in. But then we could always just revert to doing a truck that's much more like other trucks. Now, as it turns out, the re reaction has been amazing. We've had several hundred thousand people place orders for the truck. And uh, it's really been, we've seen more excitement about the Cybertruck than any product we've ever unveiled. This is what separates a leader from a follower, an innovator from a copier. Tesla, obviously, the fact that Elon Musk literally laughed at the idea of doing customer research really speaks volumes to the fact that they're not out there trying to copy or think or please f that. How about start with a blank piece of paper and just try to make the best possible product you can and see what the market thinks. A good approach, of course, it carries with it some risk, but they had a fallback plan. And by the way, seen recently in some of the media, people are talking about the fact that Tesla may make a conventional looking pickup truck. They're not going to. This was their fallback plan if no one gave a fuck about the Cybertruck. We've since established with hundreds of thousands of pre-orders that that's not a problem. There is plenty of demand out there for this weird looking, amazing, highly functional truck. But we're really fundamentally making this truck as a North American ass kicker, basically. And it's, the goal is to kick the most amount of ass possible with this, this truck. So we want it to be so, yeah, something that you could use to, you know, tow a, a boat, a horse trailer, pull tree stumps out of the ground, go off-roading, and uh, you don't even have to worry about scratching the paint because there's no paint. You could just be smashing boulders and be fine. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like some badass off-roading. You know, it's going to have the ability to access the battery pack so you, know, just, you don't even need a generator because it's got really high power, like, you know, 240 volt as well as 110, you know, high amperage, easily power, any kind of power tool situation you want. And uh, it even has a compressor built in if you need an air compressor because we have that for the air suspension. So you just tap the air compressor. So you, know, you could use it for like if you're running a construction site, great as a utility car, great as a fun car. And it's like literally body panels are bulletproof to a handgun. So probably helpful in the apocalypse. These things are seeing more apocalyptic these days, so... Let me tell you, the truck you want in the apocalypse is a Cybertruck. If we're being honest, the value proposition of the Cybertruck literally sh all over everything else in its supposed class and category. Now, I understand there's certain special use cases where you might need a flatbed where it won't be suitable, but this is going to target 80% of current pickup truck buyers, 80% of current off-road vehicle buyers. They're going for the most bang for the least buck. They're not trying to cater to every single person out there, not every single consumer, but most of them. They've got the secure locking bed, the air suspension, the thing can crouch down, like they've got the ramp at the back, you've got the air compressor, you've got access to electrical outlets, 220 volt, 110 volt, like this is a pretty impressive truck and you've got autopilot full self-driving crazy safety and almost no running costs because it runs on electricity i mean it's pretty amazing yes there are some buyers out there in the marketplace who flat out reject cyber truck not based on utility and function but aesthetics their loss
are you targeting a different type of customer than the more traditional, fiercely loyal pickup customers that are out there? We're not really trying to target anyone. If they like the Cybertruck, cool. If they don't, um, but, but yeah. So we're not doing any marketing targeting. Honestly, we just made a car that we, that we love and we, we think is cool. And those who share that feeling will buy it and those who do not will not. We're not trying to place a marketing game. We're just trying to create products that we think people will love. I love to hear this kind of thinking. Here's an analogy. Just imagine that instead of Tesla, we're talking about a guy who's interested in a woman, his target market, right? This typical nice guy, needy beta male goes, all right, I'm in, look, put this woman on a pedestal. I need her. She's exactly the one I'm going for. She's so perfect. What do I need to become for her to like me? What do I need to do? How do I please her? What do I need to change? What do I need to say? What do I need to not say? Versus Tesla, who instead of trying to change themselves and be needy and no, 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 they just go, you know what? I'm just going to work on myself and become the best version of me that I possibly can. Most women will find that incredibly attractive. I don't need to chase. I don't need to become something I'm not. I don't need to try and tart. I'll just be great and awesome. And they will come. Tesla's strategy seems to make a lot of sense. They're winning car of the year, car of the century, every freaking award ever on all of their products. Why is that? They're not trying to please. They just focus internally on making the best possible product they can, something that they would love. Then obviously, most people, if they love it, are likely to love it as well. By the way, guys, if you suck shit with women, check out 3% Man. There's a link in the description. Like seriously, it will change your life. Well, I guess over time, it would make sense to address all of the key functional areas. You know, so, you know, probably would make sense at some point to do a more compact vehicle and to do kind of like a, a van or minivan that's kind of capable of like being a, like a utility van as well as a van for people. Maybe we wouldn't do a minivan, we'd just do a van van, you know, or something in between a minivan and a van. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So there's still plenty of segments that you think Tesla could compete in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Anything really exciting? Uh, you know, one thing would be like, can you make a minivan that looks good? That, nobody's ever done that. So that's that's something that could be in the queue. And, and anything else that, that would be really appealing? Well, like I said, we, we, we've got a lot of parts that we still have to complete all of the design for manufacturing stuff and build the factory and all that. So this our product roadmap is already pretty full. But there's at least the van minivan thing and this, this, this sort of combat car. Like you want something that, you know, you could park in a tight space you know, in downtown Paris or something like that. Long-term viewers of the channel will know I called both of these products before Elon had mentioned them, the van and the compact car, but it's great to hear now on recent podcasts and interviews that Elon is discussing these as potential, probable future products, because prior to now, hasn't really said much other than covering all the major forms of terrestrial transport. But now, obviously, in the back of his mind, Elon's thinking van, compact car, who knows what else. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video and found it insightful. I recommend checking out the link in the description to watch the full interview. It's a gold mine. Really interesting to learn about how Elon is thinking about products, manufacturing, factory design, future product roadmap, and plenty more. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan. This is Solving the Money Problem, and I love you all. And don't forget your free stocks with Weeble and Steak. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know. I read all your comments. P.S. If you're still watching, you're awesome. If you'd like early access, exclusive videos, regular Q&As, our private Discord server and more, consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash solving the money problem so I can keep creating content for you guys. There's a link in the description. You can now also become a member of the channel for some exclusive perks. To learn more, click the join button next to subscribe. And don't don't forget to check out our merch store. Either way, the best form of support is you being here and watching, so thanks again.